Well, he'll still be uh, doing some of that work, but he's also the acting division director for Ag Systems, which, which I was in that role uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and then we also have the fortune, we have a couple, have a couple of AAA fellows that, uh, well, actually we have four. The two of them are, are somewhat in the science areas. One of them, uh, Sala Isa, is, a, is a, actually an engineer by background. And Angelica Van Gore is also a AAA as well as been with us and working on some of the data science and precision ags. So they helped put together this presentation. Um, one of the things, um, where's the, top oh, there it is, okay. Um, so um, with that, uh, that's pretty much my background. It's, and uh, so I'm gonna go, one of the things I thought I would do is, is, is part of this presentation is I don't know, looking at your agenda, it looks like it's across all types of industries and areas. So I don't know the, the knowledge and background of agriculture in this group. I know a few people here, and I know that that's exactly the area they work in. But uh, I think one of the things is to really kind of give you a little background on agriculture and uh, some of the challenges we have in, in uh, technologies and, and, and robotics and those types of areas. Um, if you look at the agricultural industry going back, um, NIFA actually was, is, in its predecessor agencies, was, was uh, uh, authorized back in the 1890s to support uh, the, uh, the land grant uh, universities. Land grant universities were first formed in that era, and uh, we were the uh, NIFA, and actually the previous extension service, and Crops Day Research Service, were the agencies that uh, uh, were formed to provide support for uh, uh, the land grant universities. Back in the 1890s, when uh, they, those land grants were first formed, about 50% of the U.S. population was involved in agricultural production, if you can believe that that was the number. Right now, we're probably less than 2%. Uh, so that is attributed, really, quite frankly, to the advancements in, in automation, or technologies, advancements in uh, plant breeding, advancements in, in plant and animal health. All those factors came together to basically create a, uh, uh, a basically a, um, a, a data production system that feeds us and, and exports this tremendous amount of product around the world with a very small percent of the population. Um, and I go back to, I actually grew up on a farm in western Nebraska and it was an integrated uh, livestock and uh, crop production farm. One of the crops we grew, and just give an example of how technology has changed, uh, this was back in the 60s, we grew sugar beets. Um, sugar beets were a very intensive crop in terms of production. Uh, it took 16 field operations per year to produce a crop of sugar beets. Most of that was in preparing the soil because we didn't have the technologies to plant in uh, um, basically um, um, uh, basically uh, no-till copper cropping systems. Now you have these planting systems that go through the field. You don't have to do a lot to the field. They plant it precisely where it needs to be, compact it, put it at a level that the seed can germinate, and you have better soil germinated seed. Um, and you also have a lot larger equipment that moves to the field a lot faster. It's maybe four times as wide, moves to the field twice as fast, performs all these operations. And you don't have to have people come in and mechanically thin the sugar beets because you're always overplanted so that you can get a crop of sand. So now you have mechanical thinners that can basically do uh, 100 acres in uh, uh, a couple of hours, uh, where it would take uh, a week or more for hand labor to do that, and multiple people doing the field. So those are some of the things that, so I think the bottom line is there's less time per acre involved in agriculture. And we've seen a tremendous uh, change in, in, in how that's impacted the, the, uh, the agricultural industry. If you think about, um, agriculture, and I'm, I'm trying, going to do this because I think it helps in terms of discussing technologies and where they are with the different types of, of uh, uh, classifications of crops and livestock. Um, a lot, a lot of basketball, so basically break these down into row crops, specialty crops, uh, livestock and dairy. Uh, if you think about what it takes to feed a world population, um, everyone thinks, okay, well, especially, you know, crops, your, your fruits and vegetables and, and nuts, I mean, that's the main source, but, but the reality is that's not. Uh, to generate the amount of uh, calories you need to feed a world population, you really still need those row crops and that big expanse of the land to produce those calories, uh, to boost those uh, carbs, or calories, I should say, through the four main, main uh, calorie sources, uh, potatoes, uh, corn, uh, rice, 
and, uh, and wheat. Uh, those are your more basic substance for uh, uh, calories in, in our world population. Um, specialty crops, um, there's a whole lot to be said about that. It's just expanding in terms of uh, uh, the types of fruits and the variety of things that people have accessible to. And dairy and, and, uh, and, and uh, livestock is, is always going to be there, and I, I think it's actually going to continue to grow. And part of the reason for that is if you think about um, the role of livestock in feeding the world, um, you can see some trajectories for the growth of the different livestock. And this is basically a result of as um, underdeveloped countries begin to be developed, uh, the first thing as the economic status of the, uh, the citizens increases, uh, they're, they're, one of the first things they, they include in, in terms of improving their quality of life is basically meat protein. Uh, we've seen that as, as some of the larger countries, such as, as India and China, developed and uh, increased the, the, the standard level uh, of their, their populations. And we're seeing it now in the African countries and other, other areas of any developing country. So if you think about that, that's always going to generate an increased demand uh, for, uh, for animal uh, and livestock uh, production around the world. Um, so let's think a little bit about uh, some of the things in, in precision, uh, precision automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, smart technologies, uh, a lot of you have already seen this, you're part of that, but they are continuing to completely uh, alter the agricultural landscape. And this, I'm sure this schematic many of you have seen before, it's all internet connected, uh, it's the internet of things. Um, you look at some of the, uh, uh, the, the large machinery that's out there, uh, a lot of it is uh, basically, it's, it's not totally autonomous, it's sort of around stage four, they still have operators and a lot of that is some of that is uh, regulatory, and other parts of it is just uh, that is just the comfort level of, of the, the, the place that uh, uh, the adapters and adopters of technology there are at this point. Um, you get on a modern combine, and you might have a farmer in there, and it's doing most of the work. Um, I know one individual. He gets in there. He's on his tractors. He's doing the work, and he's managing his uh, from his cell phone. He's he's managing the technologies in his grain drying. So he's shifting rain from one bin to another, he's adjusting how it's going through the, the dryers, he's looking at the moisture contents, things like that. So it creates an interesting workplace uh, which continues to, to uh, advance and change, and we don't know what the eventual societal norms will be, but it's, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to stay in tune with that. Um, so just to give you an example of when a few of the early adopters, uh, some of the progress they've made in terms of both production and uh, 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 in the use of resources. Uh, this is an example that we've been using for a while. And his name is uh, Randy Dowdy, and uh, he uses the sensors, the optimal varieties, uh, some sensor-based irrigation and fertilizer management, which basically applies just what's needed at a precise location for the crop and the soils uh, that he's growing. Uh, he uses some of the big data analytics with the help of Monsanto and Climate Corp. Uh, so through that, uh, he actually, uh, in, in 2014, when the average crop yield was about 170 for, for corn, it was 171 bushels per acre, he actually produced a crop of 503 bushels per acre. That's pretty phenomenal if you think about those types of results. So, but what are the technology challenges? Uh, they're significant in agriculture. Uh, if you think about agriculture with accepted controlled environments, which is also very interesting, and I'm not going to get into that too much in this conversation, uh, but it's, it's basically dependent on climate. It's dependent on uh, extreme weather events. Um, there are uh, changes in, in growing systems and, and big changes in, in, in the climate actually are impacting um, uh, insects and diseases. Uh, we're finding those in places we didn't find them before. Um, so, um, and invasive species also are part of that. So that's part of the challenges in terms of the changing landscape, um, the changing uh, challenges in agriculture. Um, what we want to do um, is agriculture, there are some large producers and there are some medium-sized producers and there are some small producers. So the challenge for a public agency is how do we provide opportunities that are scale neutral? So we try to look for those as we look through some of our different types of funding projects. 
And we actually have in, in, uh, in uh, NIFA, um, we actually have programs for small producers, small farms. We have programs um, that look at minority serving institutions specifically. So how do we make sure we're covering the breadth uh, that a public institution or a public federal agency should be covering? Um, the other situation you think about um, the environment and, and livestock buildings. Uh, you need robust technologies that can stand up to the, the, the conditions in those environments, the outdoor conditions that they encounter. Um, there's a wide variety of crops and operations, so it's, it's all over. Not everything, not one size fits all. Uh, you need to come up with a lot of different types of ideas. Um, there's varying fruit size uh, and plants. Um, you've got the challenge that uh, you know, visual optics are hard to generate and find a piece of fruit that's stuck inside the tree and finding ways to do that. So it becomes a matter of uh, not only just uh, figuring out how do we uh, develop the technologies, uh, also, how do we rethink how we grow crops and, crop and uh, plants? Uh, particularly when you think about your fruiting crops, uh, which you're trying to develop um, uh, mechanization and, and automation uh, to pick those and with minimizing labor. Um, one of the, you have to bring together the two aspects of plant breeding and genetics to create um, a, a, a vertical structure or some other structure that makes it easier to access and, uh, uh, and uh, harvest those crops for the technologies, the current status of uh, robotics and, and, and where we are, and where we might be in the future. Um, the big data challenges. Uh, you, you're all very familiar with this because these, these run across the full gamut of, of different types of industries. Um, in agriculture, ownership uh, can be an issue. Uh, if you think about the machinery that uh, farmers have to work with, uh, there's large companies that have produced this machinery, it collects a lot of data. Uh, as a combine goes through the field, it's collecting information on uh, yield in a very specific area because it's reading that yield information as it brings the crop into the combine. Um, you have all sorts of soil sensor data, um, you have other things that are going on, and you've got, um, so that's basically collecting information on an individual farm, and then you have the open source data that's out there that's basically climate and all those things that everyone can access to. And, and they need that type of data to make smart decisions. Um, so that has been uh, basically discussed multiple times. Uh, some companies have been very, and I'm not going to say who has and who hasn't, some companies have been very clear that the data belongs to the farm or the grower. Others are, not, are a little more vague, and it's not as clear who owns the data. Uh, but the farmers certainly have access to using it for their, their benefits. Uh, costs are a big issue. Um, profit margins are not large in a lot of segments of agriculture. And we're actually in a pretty much an agricultural industry crisis right now with the largest number of foreclosures in the last 30 years. So agriculture is not in a big, good place right now. Um, so trying to figure out how you produce products at a break even or a profit, and a profit is, is a certain, certainly an important component. Uh, so if you're thinking about how you're going to implement something, you really have to think about uh, the adopter, and it doesn't matter, agriculture is not a lot different than anyone else. No one's going to adopt it if they can't make a profit or get a return on a reasonable return on the investment. Bandwidth is a huge issue in rural America. Um, and it probably will remain that for some time. Um, and as the bandwidth, re bandwidth requirements increase on all of these devices that talk to each other, uh, we're going to have to find ways to work through that. And uh, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, quality, um, curation, Cybersecurity, all those things, and the storage of the data, and how you how you keep that is another for all all, all important aspects of it. So, uh, under Secretary Purdue, they they've really put together a case for rural broadband in the last uh, last year, and they released a report on this. Um, what the report does is it it basically. It's fairly has some limitations in its its, its uh, in how it will develop its hypothesis. So I'm going to throw some in slides over the, the next few slides. We're going to talk about some of the uh, uh, the case for how broadband uh, might uh, uh, increase uh, uh, profitability or, or, or uh, within the agriculture sector. A lot of that is first they're they're making those projections based on a very very limited amount of information. 
Um, there's a number of uh, other organizations. I think there's one called ID Tech, uh, Tech X. Uh, that's more of a private company. They, they make their projections as well. And if, that's a good place to go look at information as well. I always like to go there and see what their projections are, where they think the priorities and the growth is going to be in, in agriculture. So they put together uh, the analysis and the review of the academics, uh, the industry research, uh, validated this through some site visits uh, with producers and engaged some of the industry experts to come up with uh, uh, where the growth is going to be. They, they put a total of 34 technologies we evaluated based on their applicability in the, the field today. Um, they also took a look at where um, the industry thought and the academics some of the academics thought um, the current status of agriculture was. And, and I think all of this is debatable because if you look at uh, some of these, uh, these speculations on the innovators, the early adopters, and uh, the early majority, and, and those types of things, in some areas, um, excuse me, I think some segments of agriculture are much farther along. If you think about things like robotic milking parlors, uh, robotics have been in milking flowers, and there's thousands of those that have been deployed across the world. So that's relatively far ahead. Um, and you think about a lot of things, primarily in the uh, um, row crop area, uh, pretty well developed. You guys have already talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, equipment manufacturers and companies like Monsanto and some of the other consulting companies that provide uh, uh, support for uh, technology and, and uh, data management data analytics in, in the agricultural sector. Um, so uh, some of it is pretty close. I'm, I'm thinking especially crop, I'm starting to see some of the, it's amazing how quickly things are developing. I've seen some really interesting projects out there in the last couple of years. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the benefits uh, for each one of these three sectors. So if you break it down by, uh, they broke it down under this report uh, by production, um, market coordination and planning, and they looked at the, where uh, broadband can help with uh, um, auto, basically uh, uh, robotics and automation and data science uh, and that interchanging of the Internet of Things between devices. Um, if you look at the row crops, um, some of it, uh, about half of it is, is under the production area. Um, you've got things like field scouting is there, connected equipment. Uh, machine learning. Um, I kind of threw this out, it's kind of busy, but I think for me the most important part is not necessarily the what breakdown of the pie chart, but just the range of things that, that, that the internet can be used and helpful in the agricultural, uh, agricultural industry. Um, especially crops, uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, where they gain the most value is in market coordination. Um, that's where they're going to see the, that's that direct to the consumer sale. And you think about it, it's that fresh produce, giving that to the market, finding the highest return on investment for the markets that they can. It was basically where they felt was the most significant, this report concluded was the most significant part. Um, there's some food waste management, weather modeling, uh, some production, smart irrigation. Um, I'm not going to talk about a specific one, but we have a project where we're actually getting down to, you know, we first started talking about precision ag and, and GPS systems and trying to manage. Uh, production. We were managing it on an, an area about the size of this group of tables in the early years. Uh, the vineyard industry is now managing irrigation or can manage irrigation at the plant level. They have the individual emitters, they have little robots that can go through the field and based upon the information they're receiving actually adjust those emitters on an individual level. Uh, so that's a project that I, I think it's Yellow uh, Wineries are working on. Uh, Livestock industry, um, the big one here, and, and it, it will be for some time, and it's, it's a great area of investing, is, is, is health monitoring. Um, there's a tremendous, the, the health loss and uh, the, the death loss in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, animal production system is still the biggest factor in terms of uh, impacting their, 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 their bottom line. Um, but there's still room for other things, precision feeding. Um, and I would say probably the livestock segment is, and I don't know, I like other people's opinions, I think the livestock segment is the one that's just getting started. It's probably not as far along as the other two, if you think especially something that'll be special crops, but plant, uh, plant systems, or row cropping systems, I should say, 
are, are probably the farthest along. So I want to talk a little bit about um, USDA and how we're, we're contributing, or definitely how we contribute to this. Um, some of you are familiar, uh, uh, NEFA is actually with the primary extramural funding agency uh, for USDA in, in science, uh, education, and, and research. Uh, what makes us, we are a national, we gained a national science agency status in the Farm Bill of 2008. Uh, we went through reorganization, and that's when we became named called National Institute of Food and Agriculture. We acquired, we got an authorization for a chief scientist, um, and uh, we really began moving up in terms of our, our stature, and our funding began moving up at that time as well. Um, we're a little unique in that uh, I think we can fund research, we can fund education, and we can fund extension activities. We operate under, I think, almost 60 different authorities, 40 of which are funded. And I probably administered 35 of those in my career. So and every one of them is unique. And the reason we do that, whereas you look at the National Science Foundation, they operate under one authority. Um, and it goes back to our history. Initially, we were there to support the land grant universities. We did that through um, what we call uh, formula-based funds. Uh, we then began adding, um, basically, some competitive-based funds or some other programs. So every time Congress and our stakeholders, essentially our stakeholders working through Congress and the USDA administration, want to do something new, they needed to add a new authority. And consequently, that's why we have so many authorities in, 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 in NIFA, which basically makes me pretty valuable uh, having, having that experience because I know all of them. So um, that's, that's basically um, some of the, our budget now is about 1.7 billion. Um, it's, uh, you know, it fluctuates. Most of that is appropriate funds, some is mandatory spending. I can talk more about that at some other point. Uh, but I think what's important about NIFA is, is, is also the breadth of the sciences it gets into. Um, if you're going to try and develop uh, higher producing crops, you have a lot of, you need to look at the photosynthetics. Uh, how do you research related to that? Research related to the water use of these different crops uh, and the nutrient use, their efficiency in, in both the crops and animal production. And we've seen tremendous strides both in plant production and in, in dairy production. The water use per, um, Gallon of milk in, in dairy is, is tremendously dropped. It's less than half what it was uh, 20 years ago. Um, so, and that's basically just due to the production. And the feed efficiencies have increased tremendously in all of these different types of uh, uh, commodities. Uh, we want to support diversification. Um, diversification actually increases the breadth of the range of nutritional value of plants or of crops and, and, and uh, and, and animal products that you can consume. Uh, and we also look at the, so it's looking through the, some of the novel crops, some of the organisms, uh, and, and processing and technologies to, to support that. Um, protecting um, our uh, uh, crops and livestock as they, they grow is a big issue. So we look at uh, how do you protect them from predators, pesticides, uh, uh, so say parasites, diseases, uh, pathogenic uh, diseases. And that's a continuously changing environment as new ones come along uh, all the time. Some of that uh, we're seeing is uh, we're seeing the pests and uh, uh, invasive species come into areas we've never seen them before. Um, we're trying to figure out okay, what is going to be the most eff uh, effective uh, varieties and species for, for producers producing that particular region and, and projecting out what that's going to look like uh, and, uh, five, 10 years from now, uh, or 15. Um, and then again, the part that this is group is really interested in, that's deploying, uh, uh, developing, deploying the technologies, uh, industry, you know, the physical and digital technologies, uh, and those that, that are revolutionized the plant. Some of these I've already talked about that. Uh, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the specifics in terms of what we do. Uh, smart systems, um, lots of opportunities here. Um, cyber physical systems, robotics, uh, these are some of the opportunities and the challenges. How do you stand this up? Sensor, biological, both the bio means uh, basically the nanoscale uh, uh, 
uh, electrical machine operations in the biomeds, which is more biological and more than nanoscale. Uh, big data. Uh, there's a huge amount of data that is generated within the agriculture sector. And how do you uh, take that data? How do you sanitize it? How do you uh, develop uh, ways uh, to utilize it most effectively? And tools that can be used at the farming level. You can't get down to that level. Uh, we're not we're not doing what justice to to ourselves as a, as, a, as an industry or I guess as as, a, as, as academians I would think and, and as, a, as a public federally uh, funded agency and all is part of the food system from farm uh, through tables so we have things both in production which is mostly what we're going to talk about today but you also have the processing which we do support with that as well and uh, getting it right to the table so. What I'm going to do uh, is just to give you a few examples. There's so many projects uh, we funded over the last few years, uh, but I want to talk about some of our. Uh, if you look at our funding portfolio, and again, uh, I would encourage you to go to our, our website. It's very easy to find. Um, if you click on it and you come into that, you're going to find a list of RFAs. If you go down to the bottom of the opening page, it'll say RFA list. And that tells you all the different types of RFAs that are out there. But what I want to do is every time I talk to a group, I always try and narrow it down to the ones where I think create the best opportunities for the type of science you're working in. Um, so this is kind of a short list. Um, all of these I have had oversight over in the last few years. As a division director for uh, Ag Systems, I've been in the division of Ag Systems. Um, so National Biops Initiative, uh, we were one of the early um, um, Interagency, you know, the interagency agreement with, with the National Science Foundation back in 2012. Uh, I think that was when I was close to when I was first initiated. Um, that's really where the robotics research, the applications uh, comes, comes in. Um, what happens is National Science Foundation, uh, for both that one and the cyber physical systems, uh, administers those run the funding opportunities. So you're not going to find those. On our web page, you're going to find those opportunities on the National Science Foundation's uh, basically uh, call for, for applications. Um, we began, uh, got involved with another, just signed another MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with National Science Foundation, and began funding cyber physical systems for agriculture in 2016. Uh, how about I just say, remind me tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, that one also, uh, so we're basically contributing, we, we contributed up to five million a year. Uh, some years we've actually done a little bit less, but then we've made it up in future years. Um, so uh, what we see though, is, which I think is fascinating in both of these, is probably three years ago, uh, the interest in national in robotics and agriculture applications uh, increased so much we had to have two panels um, for the National Science Foundation. Uh, last year, maybe the year before, in cyber physics systems, we had to start having two panels. So there is a segment, obviously, which we're very thankful for, of people like you that are basically seeing the need for um, agricultural uh, applications and, and, and robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, and have come involved, uh, and, and basically have, have stepped up and provided some excellent proposals, and we've been able to fund some of those projects. Um, the other one I want to talk about, and let me get a little drink here, is the uh, Food and Agriculture Cyber Informatics and Tools. This was an interesting release. So basically, it does do with the fundamental big data analytics and tools development. Um, there's a number of different issues, which I'll get a little more detail in, in later on. Um, but uh, our first big, uh, we had some, um, um, what I want to call uh, workshop opportunities, uh, and I think 2017 we began funding those, just to bring scientists together and industry together to think about what should be the priorities and uh, how do we approach uh, uh, this cyber, uh, uh, this, this fact, we call it the fact initiative, the cyber, the, uh, cyber informatics and tools for agriculture and food. Um, we, uh, I've got a range of funding down there because uh, what we did is we had uh, nine, nine million that was uh, available through um, the Ag Systems Technology, but we also found some extra money and we also had all the other foundation programs. There's six foundation programs, I don't want to go into all those, but if it was domain specific, you could have fund, you could reapply under that one, and then we would set aside money 
So the range, I don't know exactly what the final number was. I should be able to say that because I signed off on all of it. Uh, but it, it was somewhere up in the round, around 20, I'd say maybe around 18 million uh, last in 2018. And that opportunity, these opportunities are all out there again in 2019. I think we've already received the applications and they'll be there in 2020. Uh, and what's nice about this is uh, uh, all of our programs where we could do it, we are not changing the RFA from 19 to 20. And part of that has to do with our relocation and trying to get through the transition. Because putting out a new RFA and getting it through the whole approval process is a lot of uh, basically more labor time on, on our and we just don't have it. So one of the things we did to try and adjust for that is, is make sure that we didn't have any significant changes in our RFAs. Uh, but do take a look at it. Don't assume it's going to be the exact same, but when the 2020 comes out, there might be some slight adjustments, so make sure you look at that and read through the RFA if you, if you have intent to fund. The nice part is that if you have something in the works that you got close and, and you want to resubmit it again, you're not going to have to make a, a lot of changes to that. Um, another area that uh, people don't think to look for, and it's not specific robotic, but it has to do with new innovations in technology. Uh, and that goes to the special crop research issue. They have actually five different priority areas. Some of them are plant health, some of them are air quality. Uh, diseases and pests, those types of things. But they do have a specific, and, and this is basically mandated by Congress. Uh, specialty Crop Research Initiative is a mandatory spending funding. It does not have to be approved in the Appropriations Bill. Um, so what it does is uh, um, it, uh, it addresses the, uh, the critical needs of the special crop industry. In 2014, Farm Bill adjusted and made adjustment that uh, those projects have to go through a relevancy review committee, which is an industry committee, and they will give uh, their, their opinions on which ones they think are most relevant to the industry. doesn't necessarily knock anything out, but it does come into play when you're thinking about funding opportunities. So uh, those are some of the things, small business innovative research. Um, I think what I've seen in this one, every, every uh, federal agency that has a research uh, funding has to have an SBRI uh, program. And it's a basically a small percentage that comes off of your total budget. I think it's about 3%, something on that order. Um, what we started seeing, and, and again, it's, it's one of those things that uh, um, uh, uh, what we saw is that some of the most interesting in small businesses is, is UAVs, uh, because they're interested in getting a company going. Uh, they might hit, be targeting a very niche group market. And so they're trying to get their, their off the ground with what's it, it is basically two, two process uh, funding for that. They do an initial grant, if they get that, then they get a second grant, which, which takes them further development. Um, artificial intelligence, I, I'm just kind of throwing this out there because I want to talk about the fact, which really gets into the artificial intelligence. So one of our, uh, um, Saul Isa, he put this together, and it actually talks about, we've been actually funding some artificial intelligence since about the 1997. Um, we don't fund a lot of projects up until then, but we saw that, okay, we're just getting some interest. Uh, they're coming in under some different funding opportunities. But then we wanted to go and look at the food and uh, ever suffer into a tool. So this is a cross-cutting program across all of our foundation programs. Um, and the projects are those that they basically see uh, projects that apply artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, for monitoring analytics, uh, automation, precision ag, and uh, precision livestock farming. Uh, it needs to include one or more of the other. You'll see this in the RFA. Um, and it's designed, uh, so it's a fairly wide range of, uh, of uh, funding priorities. Um, and uh, so they we funded uh, four innovation project networks. Uh, these are larger grants, these are million dollar grants. Um, and uh, then we funded about 12 standard grants. So standard grants run around 500,000, in case you're wondering. So. So I do want to give you a couple of examples of some of the projects we funded. Um, and this one has to do with the specialty crop industry. And uh, I could never remember Stravos' pronounced his last name correctly. I'll probably feel uh, really down Olos, Olos Gas. I know him quite well, but I can never get his, quite, his name, last name quite right. He's with UC Davis. Um, what he has is, uh, one of the projects he's worked on is uh, Harvesting platforms have been around for a number of years. They're first introduced in Europe many years ago. But what this project does is, and part of the reason why harvesting platforms are important, because uh, they're important to worker health and safety. 
Uh, prior to that, um, if you look at those, the ladder, most harvesting was done on ladders. Uh, workers would climb up the ladders and harvest the bag of fruit, they'd take it to a big bin, caref supposedly carefully place the fruit in the bin, and go back and, and harvest more. And, and most of their labor uh, was based upon the amount, most of their, their uh, 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 wages was based upon the amount of, of fruit that they, they picked. Um, so they would do things like, uh, I would see them literally not move the ladder, get off and move the ladder. They would walk the ladder on two legs from tree to tree. Um, so what this does is actually creates, uh, and then they would have all of the, the weight that they would have to carry with the bag. If you look at this uh, uh, platform, um, you see those, those black tubes? So the platform can go up, oops, never mind, uh, let me go back on that. The platform can go up and down, at, um, which is in the front, and uh, those tubes, essentially what they do is they're not putting it in a bag, they're dropping the fruit right into the tube. So you're getting the advantage of the, uh, the eye-hand coordination and the, the highest of, of the, the worker themselves, and you're also taking the, uh, the tube to actually gently convey the, uh, the, the, the apples or the fruits or whatever you're picking into the, into the, the container. Um, the technology is involved, so they basically have uh, vision imaging that actually identifies the fruit, that identifies the speed that the pickers are working at, and adjusts the speeds of the, the, uh, the, the height of the platform and the speed of the vehicle going through the, the field so that it can optimize the planting rate. Um, it results in about a 75% efficiency in the workers, what they can pick themselves. Um, there's not the fruit damage because the conveying system reduces the, the fruit damage. And the workers feel a lot better at the end of the day. Um, so that was one of the things. Um, the other thing is uh, there's this uh, um, feral bot berry. So some of the berry picking, particularly strawberries, you may have some of these large machines you see in the field and they've got the boxes and they're putting it up on the the boxes themselves, but that's not true in, in all applications. It doesn't really help smaller operations as well. So one of the things we've seen develop in the relatively inexpensive um, berry transports, I'm just going to show you, this just shows the berry transporter itself. Just a quick video, just see it running through the field. So what it does is it, uh, those little transporters take, they, they pack, they, they, they pick their, their, their box of berries. The transporter takes it to the end of the field, delivers it uh, to the system at the end of the field, or the, the trucks at the end, and then it comes back. Um, the reason this is helpful is one thing again is, is if you're talking about the so they're getting paid by the, the, the amount that they, that they harvest. So they don't have to run down the, and literally they would run down the field and create a tripping hazard that could easily fall. Uh, and then they'd run back up and then start picking again. Um, this eliminates that. The other thing with their, what uh, uh, Stratus is, is doing with, with his group and also the Western Center for Agricultural Safety and Health is not only are they looking at the transporters are, are relatively developed, they're relatively expensive, but they're equipping them with sensors and human sensors. So if the picker is in a smooth position, that will come back to it. They have to stand up and stretch. So some of those things, are, so that's some of the things they're doing to, to help them improve the, the work set. Um, the other things that are important is if you look at the, the, uh, uh, the combined next generation sequencing, uh, some of that works are developing both the, the, uh, ton, the vehicles in the sky and the vehicles, uh, the AV vehicles, uh, looking at screening for uh, gen genotypes and phenotypes. Um, when you develop new varieties and genotypes of varieties, you need to do phenotype uh, analysis to see how they're producing, how they're re reacting to diseases in the field how they're growing, and that's a lot of work. That yeah, used to be done by hand labor. They would go out and take samples of the products. Uh, they would look at their different aspects of the sensing. Uh, now we can have robots to go out and do all of that. Um, so they'll collect all the phenotype of data, and it's actually accelerated uh, how quickly we can implement new varieties in, into the agricultural production system. 
Um, there's also a lot of these things that are going on. Just do a general monitor. These are kind of the, the they're kind of the slower robots. You think about the fast, high-speed stuff that's involved in, in harvesting. But if you're thinking about the things that you're going to deploy in the field and they can go and work underneath the canopy of the crop and, and take data at the critical locations, it can be some of these. They don't have to be the high tech, they can be lower tech and, and lower speed uh, operations. Um, identifying uh, using uh, vision learning for, for disease detection. Uh, this is a project that looks at disease detection in soybeans. Um, and uh, it's, it's using visual imagery to try and identify the early onset of these diseases so you can actually apply uh, uh, interventions to keep the disease from spreading at an early stage before it gets too far. And you know, we've seen some, some very significant examples in, the, in over years where some of these diseases spread throughout entire cropping systems and cause some significant damage to crops uh, without those early detection, which could have been prevented with early detection and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, application of uh, uh, removal of the uh, the, 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 uh, this disease. Um, as again, I mentioned uh, earlier in that first uh, quite, uh, slide about animal health. Uh, this is a project uh, in uh, Iowa State. Um, it uses uh, about 2.5 million U.S. cattle die each year from health uh, issues. So what this is doing is using UAVs. Uh, they're actually doing facial recognition of the cattle. So they can individually identify each of these cows, uh, these of these calves. Uh, they can go out, uh, the calves are also wearing some devices, they can check their heart rate, they can check some of their health conditions, they can log all of this on an individual basis. They can go out, so you've got these cattle out in a, a pasture somewhere, these UAVs can come around, they can uh, pick up and monitor each one, check its health, and, uh, and keep tabs on, on them. And it's, uh, there's a uh, website there, and I can you know send you that. Uh, I think we've got that. Actually, that's on here. Uh, but it's uh, it's. Uh, I'm trying to think. This slide is not showing me. Okay, there was a credit. Huh? It's not there. To I did identify the. Uh, the it's a Dr. Hogue at uh, Iowa State University uh, is doing this. He's in the mechanical engineering department. But he's working with the engineers in the ag engineering and the biological engineering department. So they can also look at the weight size, they can look at the physical activity. Physical activity is important in thinking about health of an animal. Um, so that's one of the things, there's some things that are, that are out there that this one I think we just funded in 2018, so we haven't seen much results from it yet. Um, I'm done with the examples, but there's something I do want to talk about that I think is important. Um, and part of this comes back to um, I live in, I've lived in the, you know, the, the, the D.C. metro area. I've lived in Virginia for the entire time I've been here. Um, when I initially moved here, I lived out in Manassas and an hour and a half each way. Uh, when my kids were out of college, and I launched them, and one of them had to be launched twice. Um, so, you know, that can remember that the show with the Matthew McConaughey launching, failure to launch. Okay, I had one failure to launch. Uh, but uh, so what we did is we sold the house and the real estate agent said just make sure he knows he doesn't transfer the property, so that worked. Um, and then we moved into Arlington and I got rid of my hour and a half commute and got it down to a half an hour. And I got a little bored. Um, I had all this extra time. So there's a, 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 basically there's a department called Science and Technology Studies. And what it is, it's the social sciences studies of technology. It includes anthropology, it includes political science, it includes history, um, it includes sociology. Uh, so was, that was the formation of it. Um, for an engineer, that was a very different way of thinking of things. But what I learned from that is uh, technology influences social norms, but social norms determine what technologies will be accepted or rejected. So after I did that, it took me a few years, but I finally was able to convince the ABC I need to hire a sociologist who understood this and could lead a program that looked at how we bring along the social sciences with the technical sciences that were supported. Because we all know that many of the things that, uh, that come along and we develop, whether it's genomics or nanotechnology or all those other things that people don't completely understand, but they are subject to people who will create fear of what they do not know. Um, so how do you bring those things along in terms of social sciences so that the technologies you're developing 
can be adjusted or you can know what you need to do on a social science level to help promote them getting implemented and adopted. Um, so that's, if you go down to our own ARC, it's also under, uh, ARC is one of the foundation programs, that's the Academic and Rural Communities, also is over that. And we started the social implications of food and agriculture technologies as a priority area, I think two or three years ago now. And we've had a fairly number of good applications. I think we started with uh, genetics initially, but it's, it's basically broader than that. We've done some things in nanotechnology and, and how uh, society, what they're willing to accept in food and what they're not willing to accept in food production. Um, most of us, they want nanotechnologies to uh, uh, maybe say check for safety and all those types of things and protect the foods, but they don't want the nanoparticles in their food. So these things are important elements to make sure you bring those sciences along. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm done. And uh, I don't know where I am on time. Not too bad. Is it okay? All right. Yeah. Thank you. So there's been sort of a recent sort of controversy around uh, right to repair bills and whether farm right to repair laws um, and whether, for example, small farmers, if I'm a small farmer and I want to modify my tractor and install open source software to control it, for example, I'm not allowed to do that because of manufacturer restrictions. And so presidential candidates like Elizabeth Warren and others are proposing right to repair laws for farm equipment. And I'm wondering if uh, NIFA has or is even allowed to have a position on something like that. Well, um, no, we don't. Uh, NIFA is a science agency. Uh, we hope our science informs uh, policy decision making, um, but um, that's uh, just have to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering about that graph that you showed earlier with. Um, I guess the trend as automation increases, the farm size increases, and also fewer farms, um, okay. and less time per acre. I was right. just wondering what your perspective is on that trend, um, if it's kind of a, ne a necessary thing that, uh, you know, as we continue to do research and, and develop new technologies, that that um, trend will necessarily continue, and perhaps, you know, Increasing production and efficiency and all those good things, but maybe also at the cost of those smaller farmers and maybe disadvantaged communities and what you see as the role of technology could be in perhaps supporting those smaller farmers and communities and, and empowering more people than just, you know, the big farms. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't show any small, but we do have some, some um, farmers, newer beginning farmers, smaller farmers, they're the ones that are in the farmer market. They're taking advantage of some of the things uh, that, some, that basically data has to offer, as well as some of their own sensing types of things. So you're right, we need to develop those, and, and we hope that we can get some of that done. But a lot of that is our application pool that comes in. Um, but I think that trend will consider, will continue. But I, I think what you're gonna find is, is the smaller producers are adapting, some of them are adapting as well, and they're finding their niche markets. They're finding their farmer uh, farm to, to food to food markets directly. They're not going through. They're doing smaller things close to urban areas. We see a lot of that uh, going on. Um, I do think it's 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 troubling. Um, I grew up on a more of a mid-sized farm, uh, but it was a farm that also failed when I was sixteen. Um, so I know I know how that works. Um, but uh, um, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, we try and encourage it, again, through some of our programs that, that look at small farms specifically, things that look at um, some of our, 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 our institutions that really cater to this, or really their main clientele base are small producers. And we do that through a number of different things, but the technology one has is, is always been a tough one. So I don't have, I can't say, I, I can't say we're going to do, we're going to make any huge changes there. Hello. Um, I wondered what your opinion is on robotic technology enabling permaculture or polyculture in the US. Um, like having multiple crops on one field. Oh, multiple crops on one field? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, yeah, we don't have a position on that, um, okay. but um, I would, uh, I would see. I don't see why we wouldn't support that. I mean, we're, we support certainly sustainable ag, we support crop rotation. Um, yeah. That's very important in terms of soil health. So if it's, uh, yeah, we do things related to soil health, but that's very important in terms of what you're describing. Uh, could you give us a feed on the current agenda? I guess that's what I'm hearing. It's not on the current agenda. Okay, on the current agenda? Okay. Of NIFA. Of NIFA, okay. All right. Um, maybe it's just how it's cast. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I. <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's, no that's, that's good feedback. So. No, so, sorry. No, that's what I understood from your answer. Oh. Oh, I, it, it may be in, in ways that I'm not familiar with. Uh, I, I would say it's probably more in, in terms of some things we're doing sustainable ag. And. Uh, um, yeah, I think I, like like I've heard that idea in the robotics community that right now there's um, that right now the um, you would use one farmer that drives a very big tractor so that you can have the scale in the system. Um, but then if we maybe have autonomous tractors, we can make each tractor smaller and then uh, have higher precision controls in agriculture which might enable us to farm and um, like multiple crops at, on the same field like for example a uh, fruit tree and then underneath there's growing some herbs or whatever uh, yeah. but it, it like I, I, so i heard that as an idea so i was interested in if it is like a valid idea in in the NIFA area or if it's on the current agenda so so a, a lot of the things, some of what you're proposing, we probably haven't said, put something out there specifically related to it, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be relevant under some of these funding opportunities. I mean, that would be a very novel concept, and you know, put together a good proposal and, and go for it. Dell, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for the uh, very interesting presentation. I, I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the possibility of using robotics and data science in agriculture. But could you say a little bit more about the profit margins? My impression is that margins for agriculture are troublingly small. And if that's the case, how do you go from research through this value of death to actually actual commercial application? Well, it's, it's basically uh, eliminating they do eliminate some cost factors uh, when they go through that. Uh, it's, it's a particularly difficult time right now, as I mentioned, with, with the prices where they are. Uh, but agriculture does go through different phases. What I've seen is uh, when it cycles up, then people start making those technology investments. And there is a definite uh, change in, in, in what the producers get. And I, I know there's, there's certain... I, I can help with answer sure. that question. Yeah. <laughs> But the agriculture volume is a lot bigger than other areas. It's a huge volume. And, uh, and when you talk about machines, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the profit per pounds, very small pennies, but around millions and millions of pounds a day. So in that case, added up, that's gross margin is quite high. That way, for through automation. That's what I said. The automation helps them reduce their costs in the long run. So they're looking at the return on investment. Uh, just like anyone who's going to invest, they're going to do that. So it, that's part of the adoption part, is they're not going to adopt it until they're pretty, pretty sure it's that technology is going to work uh, for them in the long run. And there's lots of factors involved. I mean, they've got to consider, are they going to have water uh, 10 years from now? Are they going to have you know, a lot of the resources that they have? So there's a, it's a very complex decision making. Yeah, Brad, thank you this, for this excellent 3D uh, presentation and overview. There were things in NIFA that I didn't know that <laughs> this, is, this is great, thank you. Uh, just, you know, for uh, comments just regarding the question on permaculture intercropping, I mean, NIFA has been really supporting intercropping. I think it's a matter of terminology, mm -hmm. intercropping, you know, uh, different crops under fruit trees and so forth, as it may be. Uh, you know, sort of survived under the shadow, I mean, shade and so on and so forth. NIFA has been supporting those. And application of robotics to intercropping, I and mean, these are, again, 
new area and, and so forth, so I think within the packages of other AFRI programs, it is generally has been supported right. by NIPA. I mean, forgive me for making that comment, but I know that intercropping has been really promoted and supported by NIPA in the past. So. And I know we have some projects on irrigation in, in Nebraska that do intercropping. Uh, we have some things that, uh, in, in basically in forestry and in those areas, that, that look at the intercropping as well. Uh, Eric Norland, who's also was, was basically got a position as one of the National Science Liaison, he's more an expert on, on forestry and environmental issues. He would, I think he would know more of that about those pro programs. If I, can, I can have him get contact with you if you'd like. So, yes? Hey. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we'll that. Yeah. Yeah. So really appreciate the information, the way it's tying together a lot of the inputs from the technology side as well as the agriculture side, which is a big disconnect that we see with a lot of the people we talk with. Uh, one thing I want to specifically ask about was your NIFA focus and a lot of the discussion here is focused on productivity and increasing productivity, things like that. One of the aspects that we see as a natural outgrowth or result of this is the ability to put just the amount of chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizer in the place it's needed, where it's needed, when it's needed, also reduces runoff. But we haven't seen a take up by EPA or anybody else in the interest of environmental protection by using precision agriculture. Could you comment about either NIFA's or EPA's or anybody else's interest in that aspect of precision ag and how it can help protect the environment? Well, that, that's been a big part of sustainable ag, on precision ag for, over, uh, for the years in terms of just putting the right amount on uh, of both water and pesticides and, and fertilizer uh, based upon optimum growth of the plant and reduction of, of runoff of any chemicals. Um, that's, yeah, it's been there for quite some time. Uh, EPA's interest, um, that's that's hard to, to speculate on. It, it kind of comes and goes and, and they're going through transitions as well. Um, so we, they, do have, they do have a research focus and we do coordinate with them. Um, we used to anyway, uh, so we're kind of like we'll keep that stuff going as much as we can. Yeah, I saw that two a uh, lot of interest slides, but two of them that's very interesting. Could you bring to the uh, the one is that uh, the seafood is in the spectrum in the middle of that uh, bar slides. The other one is on uh, special crops and uh, rural crops and the uh, special crops and then there and there this one. Okay. Yeah, that's two. Yeah. See that? Could you bring it back that one? Uh, the, this is very interesting. I was wondering where the seeds are going to fit in this picture there. Uh, what the seafood in previous one is in the middle of the bar, which is uh, economically it's uh, quite significant. The previous is bar curve. Yeah. <laughs> it's a graphic. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. No, uh, we we do have aquaculture programs, uh -huh. and uh, we we've, we've been funding different things over the years. Uh, there is some aquaculture interest in in, in, in basic, particularly also in the, the the health aspects and monitoring. And, it's a number of different things in, in, in aquaculture. So we, we've, we've had an aquaculture national program leader as long as I can remember. Um, I don't believe he but went with the agency, but that'll be one, obviously, we'll need to replace. Oh, okay. uh, seafood is quite a bit there. <laughs> it's a, it is quite a bit. Um, and uh, there's, there's both the uh, there's, there's wild and then there's the farm raised. And the farm raised is obviously where we're going to put most of our efforts. So. Mm -hmm. Would that be a part of the specialty crops? Or no? no, no, it's not. Um, the only way, it, it, it could be part of a controlled environment uh, production, but it's really not part of the specialty. I don't know how that, is that what that looks like? I, my, my vision is that bottom part supposed to look like fish? Okay, I don't, I don't see fish there, but anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next slide I think did talk about. Yeah, oh, fish. Yeah, there they are. You see that? Yeah. Right, it's man yeah, so there's considerable increase, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of the... Well, 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 you think about it. I mean, one of the very first things I learned was feed efficiency. Um, the most efficient uh, meat-producing animal is a fish. And the, more, the reason they're so efficient is they don't have to fight gravity. Yeah. After that comes poultry. And then yeah. hogs. And then cattle are the least efficient. So. Thank you. Yeah, Raj? Hi, uh, thanks, Brad, for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. I particularly appreciated your last slide, the Humans Matter, the Societal Acceptance uh, talk. So my question is somewhat related to that. Um, what is your um, uh, feedback, or what, what kind of feedback are you getting from farmers in terms of adoption of technologies as it relates to robots taking jobs? So do you 
have, do you get pushback from the farmers in terms of adoption? Uh, do you see any significant roadblocks? How, how is it being perceived within that community and what is uh, NIFA's role, if any, in trying to maybe, uh, you know, put down those, some of those concerns to us? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't call it pushback, but I would call it um, everyone, uh, I don't, the, every individual determines the credibility in somebody else. So another farmer who's done it well is more credible than a scientist or someone else going and tell them, you know, I think this is a great adoption tool. I saw that early on uh, as an extension engineer that um, I have a fair amount of credibility, but not as much as a, as a producer who's making things work. Um, the early adopters and that are making money, they get attention. Uh, years ago, and this goes way back, it was more than 30 years ago, I was, a, uh, I was an extension specialist. I was working with a, uh, a farmer who had developed uh, subsurface strip irrigation for cotton production, and he was highly successful at it. He worked with the, the industries on how to maintain those systems. Um, he worked with a, a very uh, tillage system that he designed. Essentially, what it did is it, uh, uh, one of the things, and this is probably gets more information you want, um, cotton, you have to plow it down so the roots don't stand the ground so you, to prevent boll weevil infestation. Uh, what he would do is he invented a group of converging discs that lift the taproot out and minimized uh, the amount of tillage so it wouldn't damage the, uh, the, the subsurface strip condition. And he was, you know, he was making a tremendous amount of money. He traveled the world to get his information. Big farmers do that. One last question. Anybody have any questions? Okay, actually, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I, I know like uh, NIFA recently also has a, another program called Sustainable Agriculture Systems, right? So, but it yes. is listed here. So, what do you see the you know the uh, robotics, the role of robotics and smart technologies yeah. in that system? Yeah, is it, is sustainable ag systems is it is part. Okay, so, uh, it's you, you basically it's, it's looking at the entire production system. Um, it's rolled together a lot. We call them our, our uh, coordinated agricultural programs. They're large programs, uh, multi-million dollar grants. Generally, they're multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, looking at the whole system. Obviously, when you look at the whole system, robotics and, and technologies is going to be part of that. So yes, it would be that. Uh, this was basically, we had a lot of specific identified uh, caps, but now we're putting everything under this cap. Water, uh, production, uh, pet, animal production, all of those things, and technologies. <clears throat> okay, thank you so thank much, you Brad. Other day. So Brad is also going to be a panelist at the end of the uh, the symposium. So uh, if you have any further questions, yeah, he will be with us. Uh, well, thank you. And this is the fun part for me. Now I get to listen to what you guys are doing. <laughs> thank you.